This PowerPoint presentation offers a comprehensive discussion of a wide variety of technical and human aspects associated with the cable car catastrophe in northern Italy. Wire rope failure, human failure. Here is a synopsis of these multifaceted topics. Background information. Low probability, high impact events. Moral hazard, cable car mechanic and management. COVID-19 and hull rope corrosion. Vicious circle, haul rope and emergency brake. Moral hazard, wire rope experts and conflict of interest. Wire rope experts, MRT advertising hype versus reality. Cable car accident causation model, aka Swiss cheese model. Introduction. Cable car accident in Italy. On the 23rd of May 2021, an aerial tram on the Stresa Alpino Mata Rone. Cable car crashed to the ground after a traction or haulage cable snapped about 5 meters, 20 feet, from the summit of Mata Rone, a mountain near Lake Maggiore in northern Italy. The crash killed 14 passengers in the cable car and seriously injured one child. The cable car was traveling on a line connecting the town of Stresa with the summit when it plunged into a wooded area. The crash occurred as a cabin was ascending on the line's upper section from the middle station at Alpino towards the summit. When the haulage cable snapped, in very close proximity of the summit station at low speed, the cabin careened until it collided with a pylon, then fell about 54 meters, 180 feet, before tumbling down the steep slope of the mountain, stopping after impacting trees. Footage captured by a surveillance camera from the summit station depicted the cabin suddenly and violently being pulled backwards at the moment the cable snapped while approaching the platform. Hikers reported hearing a loud hiss shortly before the crash, believed to have been caused by at least one of the cable lines snapping. Television imagery later showed the snapped, thinner traction cable hanging from the pylon. On 26 May 2021, three employees of the cable car company were arrested. One of the three worked as a freelancer for the company but was an employee the company in charge of regular maintenance work on the cable car. According to police, they had intentionally deactivated the automatic emergency brake as a malfunction had repeatedly led to the halting of the cabins. After the service resumed, the cable car showed anomalies. The cable car had been traveling in that way for several days and had made several trips. Technical checks were performed, including a check to remedy inefficiencies but they had not been decisive in resolving issues, investigators said. Based on photos from the disaster site, experts have been able to determine that at least one of the gondola's brakes had been disabled with a steel clamp, which is usually employed during specific maintenance activities. If the emergency brakes had been functional, they would have held the cabin steady after the cable snapped. The move was made in the belief that a cable breakage could never have happened. The operations manager admitted that the emergency brake had been manipulated. Repeated spurious activation of the emergency brake had occurred. And, to maintain the operation of the cable car, they deactivated the emergency brake. The reason for the breaking of the haulage cable is unknown. Here is a newscast from the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation, SRF. Gabor Oplotka, professor emeritus from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology is a renowned ropeway expert. Obviously blocking the emergency brake has been practiced in the past, and they got away with it because haul rope damage is rare. Why block an emergency brake at all? It gets triggered by reduced tension in the hull rope. The brake in Stresa seemed oversensitive and kept tripping and disrupting operations. Clamps prevent this. For maintenance, this is convenient. Otherwise, it's criminal. Low probability, high impact events. The cable car catastrophe in Italy is an extreme risk event with a very particular risk structure. This means, it is a very rare, i.e., very low probability event that, if it happens, has catastrophic consequences. Other events of this type are the recent Florida building collapse, or plane crashes, nuclear accidents, fatal car accidents, 
bridge collapses, etc. These extreme risk events are rare, and various groups of people view them from very different angles. If catastrophes happen, inexperienced outsiders have a hard time making the transition from the perception of, this is completely safe, to, oh my god, there is danger. They greatly overestimate the risk, and then try to avoid even everyday situations at all cost. Some might even develop phobias like fear of flying or other anxieties. A complete misjudgment because these events are extremely rare indeed. The opposite is true for professionals. They operate under the misconception that these rare events never happen. They systematically underestimate the hidden dangers. In their opinion, over their entire professional life, of say 30 years, nothing has ever happened. Typically, they consider built-in safeties as absurdly redundant and unnecessary. This attitude tends to mutate into the majority opinion among professionals that quote-unquote, these rare events will never happen. In this context and as an aside, it is prudent to heed Mark Twain's advice. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. Following this consensus opinion, professionals tend to become complacent. They let their guards down and take shortcuts. This leads to typical moral hazard situations. Government and semi-government safety agencies, together with standards and regulations, are established to prevent moral hazard problems. While these agencies might have less expertise than others in their community, they have different interests and agendas. Their sole responsibility is safety, irrespective of cost or any other considerations. Moral hazard A moral hazard occurs when an entity has an incentive to increase its exposure to risk because it does not bear the full costs of that risk. For example, when a corporation is insured, it may take on higher risk knowing that its insurance will pay the associated costs. A moral hazard may occur where the actions of the risk-taking party change to the detriment of the cost-bearing party after a financial transaction has taken place. Moral hazard can occur under a type of information asymmetry where the risk-taking party to a transaction knows more about its intentions than the party paying the consequences of the risk. Under these circumstances, the risk-taking party has a tendency, or incentive, to take on too much risk from the perspective of the party with less information. One example is a principal-agent problem, where one party, called an agent, acts on behalf of another party, called the principal. If the agent has more information about his or her actions or intentions than the principal, then the agent may have an incentive to act too riskily, from the viewpoint of the principal, if the interests of the agent and the principal are not aligned. Moral hazard is a situation in which one party engages in risky behavior or fails to act in good faith because it knows the other party bears the consequences of its behavior. In general, those who pay the costs have limited information about the other party, i.e., the risk-taking party, they are transacting with. Moral hazard is a situation in which one party, the risk-taking party, engages in risky behavior because it knows the other party, the risk-bearing party, bears the consequences of its behavior. In general, those who pay the costs have limited information about the other party they are transacting with. In the present case, the cable car company is the risk-taking party, while their customers are the risk-bearing party. Obviously, the company, management, owners and shareholders, have a profit motive, and are in a very particular moral hazard situation this is best described by the following rant that we transcribed from a YouTube video. Here is the passionate rant as transcribed from the above-mentioned YouTube video. Here, we have a complete failure of management as well as their technician, who, as stated by the company, is quote-unquote qualified and competent.
This technician disabled the emergency brakes thinking, there is no conceivable way that the hall cable could break. In his 30 years as a technician he has never seen it happen. The brakes were dragging, which increased the load on the hall rope. Sick and tired of fixing the problem, he just took the easy way out. This is essentially a management problem because technicians should not have the latitude to make this call. It's utterly absurd. However, the management of the corporation never found it necessary to interfere. Corporations have only one objective, profits, and if you have an entity with only this purpose, you must have some framework so that the quest for profit does not kill people. That's where governing bodies and standards come in. Standards such as B30 or ISO 4309 show what wire rope maintenance is. Just follow the rules. This means, just fix these damn brakes. It's an emergency brake and not working. Just shut it down. The profit is not worth people dying. Customers enter a contract with a company by buying a ticket to ride an aerial tramway. Implicit in this contract, the quid pro quo, is that the company will maintain and apply the regulations. There is a breach of contract. Is that not fraud? Is it gross negligence? If the right thing had been done, the people would still be alive. Here is the cable car technician. And here is his management. The technician has been with the company for many years and he is quite familiar with its corporate culture. He understands, or thinks he knows, that he was hired to keep the cable car operation and company profits up. Within the company hierarchy, he is in a very responsible position, with little authority. This puts him into a precarious moral hazard situation, which is symbolized on the slide by the vulture flying overhead. So, over the years, like many humans would, he took shortcuts. He took chances and he was careless. For many years he tempted fate, and kept the operations going. Finally, after the long COVID shutdown, he got on shaky ground, and fate caught up to him. The bottom fell out from under him, and disaster and tragedy struck. catastrophe has happened. Hopefully, at least let's learn from it. Why did the haul rope fail? What happened? Why and how did it break? At this point, we don't know. And details may never be disclosed. However, a few facts are known. For example, due to COVID-19, the cable car operation was shut down for more than a year. Presumably, the cabins were parked at the stations, with the haul ropes stationary over long periods. They were exposed to the elements like wind, rain and driving rain, snow and snowstorms, ice and ice melt, etc. Under these conditions, certain sections along the length of the rope were exposed to intense flows of water, and permanently wet with no chance to dry. Furthermore, on both sides of a pylon, while standing, the haul rope is slightly bent down. This opens the distance between the strands on top of the rope and tightens them on the bottom. This allows water to axially percolate inside the rope, thus exacerbating the above described situation. These conditions can abet severe localized, and extremely dangerous, corrosion. Detecting this type of rope deterioration is next to impossible by visual or single-function LF-only MRT inspections. In contrast, during normal operations, the haul rope is never exposed to the above-described conditions. It is consistently moving, which will keep it dry. The stationary track rope is dried by the wheels of the cable car moving over it. The pictures above illustrate severe localized, and very dangerous, corrosion of stationary ropes that are caused by dripping water.
The graphics are specifically intended to explain the situation for a cable car haul rope that has been idled by COVID-19 over long time periods. Similar problems are well known from the American and Australian mining industry where hoist ropes have been sitting idle, exposed to water, rain, or condensation from moist air over long periods. These conditions can exist while the conveyance is parked at the collar of a shaft or in similar situations. For further explanations, please follow the discussion, and then the case study on the next slides. Here is a short background discussion of corrosion in wire ropes. Corrosion is a serious hazard to a wire rope. Corrosion pitting causes stress concentrations. Furthermore, corrosion pitting inhibits the free movement of wires and strands, which produces additional stresses in wires. The increased wire stresses combined with the above-mentioned stress concentrations can drastically accelerate the development of fatigue breaks. Wires can also corrode uniformly over their entire surface which may reduce their cross-sectional area and cause loose wires. Rust can cause shallow pitting on the working surfaces of a rope where the steady rubbing action of the sheave prevents deep cavities. This mechanism accelerates wear. Furthermore, deep corrosion pitting on the surfaces of internal wires can severely shorten service life. The severity of corrosion often varies along the length of a rope. Frequently, corrosion is localized but, nevertheless, dangerous. A corrosive environment often exists in certain zones along the length of the mine shaft. Corrosion often occurs in rope sections which stay in these corrosive zones over extended periods. Corrosive areas are usually located where large and abrupt changes of temperature and or humidity occur. For example, see the figure, below points where water or moist air can enter the shaft. A humid shaft pit. Fog areas in ventilation shafts. Locations with increased air velocities. The extent of corrosion is often difficult to gauge and, as shown by experience, usually underestimated. Rust and dirt frequently clog up the rope surface and hide loose wires. Cores of IWRC, i.e., independent wire rope core, ropes are prone to deteriorate and eventually fail without externally visible indications. In the absence of external indications, visual inspections are useless for the evaluation of core deterioration and the detection of core failures. This makes magnetic rope testing, MRT, indispensable for the reliable and safe inspection if IWRC ropes. The following case study presents the complete non-destructive evaluation, examination, NDE, of an IWRC rope, i.e., a slope hoist rope sitting idle over long periods while the conveyance was parked at the collar of the shaft. Here is a section of the rope that was distranded to show the interior deteriorated condition. Water was dripping down onto the rope outside the hoist house, then, percolated down inside the rope and accumulated in one spot, causing very narrowly focused corrosion. The percolating water and its accumulation, including the resulting localized corrosion, are indicated by the falling water drops. The NDT Technologies chart recording shows the corresponding LMA and LF indications. Please click to watch the following video with more explanations. Okay, this is our two-foot section of rope, and the rope has been cleaned. And we can see on examination, we do have some outer crown wear to the wires and some peening is present on the outside of the wires. Uh, as we take one strand apart, uh, you will note we have inner strand nicking present on the underside of the wires. Where they meet with the IWRC. So we remove one strand of rope and the second strand. And again, we, we see exhibited inner strand nicking on the wires in contact with the IWRC. As we further disassemble and remove the strands from the outer 
from the rope. We observe the core uh, of the rope where it has failed. And this portion internal to the rope simply comes out. And this is where localized corrosion has deteriorated to the rope to the point where it has actually failed the IWRC. Because of the loss of core support to the rope, upon closer examination, we can see sections of wear uh, where the core had actually failed uh, due to corrosion, very localized corrosion. And due to the, the pressure increase, how the strands are actually putting pressure on each other due to the failed internal core. Vicious circle. The above discussion identified corrosion as a potential reason of haul rope failure. Another possible cause of failure might have been the interaction between the malfunctioning emergency brake and the deteriorating rope. This process could have started a vicious circle, which will now be discussed. Vicious circles cause and effect. A vicious circle is a cause and effect sequence of reciprocal causes and effects in which two or more cause and effect elements intensify and aggravate each other, leading inexorably to a worsening of the situation. The term vicious circle refers to complex chains of events that reinforce themselves through a feedback loop with no tendency toward equilibrium. These systems are positive feedback loops in which each iteration of the cycle reinforces the previous one. These cycles will continue in the direction of their momentum until an external factor intervenes and breaks the cycle. Of course, we don't know at this point. But the interaction between the deteriorated haul rope and the malfunctioning emergency brakes might have started a vicious circle. Then, by disabling the brakes, the mechanic broke the vicious cycle. Let's discuss this hypothesis. On the left of this slide is a template of the vicious circle that will be discussed. On the right is a cause and effect table to keep track of all interactions. We start out with initial haul rope damage, which, by interacting with the drive sheave, or other mechanism, can cause jerky tension in the haul rope. As designed and intended, Abrupt variations of the haul rope tension trigger the emergency brake. Sudden application of the emergency brake causes shock loading, which, in turn causes additional haul rope damage. And the, the circle vicious is cycle now will start. The vicious cycle is glaringly obvious to the mechanic, and he has to confront this quandary. The right thing for him to do would be to shut down the operation and to find and fix the root cause of the problem. However, he is in a moral hazard situation, as described. Therefore, he disables the emergency brake. This breaks the vicious cycle but opens the door for disaster. Without the emergency brake, the already safety critical haul rope becomes a single point of failure, SPOF. Please follow the link for further explanations of SPOF. This opens the door to disaster. If you will, the cabin together with the passengers is now hanging by a thread. 
when the hull rope breaks, catastrophe strikes. Wire Rope Inspection Experts, Moral Hazards and Conflicts of Interest The wire rope community including wire rope operators, manufacturers, service and inspection companies, inspectors, codes and standards committees, safety oversight agencies, to name just a few, often rely on the advice of experts to make critical decisions. In cases where the expert is not directly affected by the consequences of his advice, and where the quality of his recommendations is not verifiable, a moral hazard problem naturally arises. One such scenario occurs when assessing the likelihood and the impact of low probability, high impact events such as wire rope failures under varying rope operating and maintenance conditions. Here is a typical example of a moral hazard, conflict of interest situation. Wire rope experts form a close knit community, dominated by one university based group of mechanical engineers. This group plays a prominent role in professional committees, and it exerts undue influence on wire rope codes and standards. The above-mentioned group of mechanical engineers has also developed and is marketing MRT instrumentation, and they are promoting their wire rope inspection services. On the other hand, acting simultaneously as independent consultants, these commercial activities put them into a blatant conflict of interest situation. Furthermore, without the necessary professional expertise, Mechanical engineers are ill-equipped to develop state-of-the-art electronic MRT equipment. Just like electrical engineers with insufficient knowledge of aerodynamics have no business dabbling in airplane design. Consequently, their MRT equipment is second-rate. It is of the single-function LF-only design. Like visual inspections, LF-only instrumentation is geared towards the detection of single broken surface wires, not suitable for the assessment of broken wires in clusters, corrosion, winding on drum damage, and other types of serious rope deterioration. This is outright dangerous. Overhyping their services and their MRT equipment, they promise wire rope safety, implicitly or explicitly. Customers and clients tend to rely on these assurances. That way low probability, high impact events like wire rope failures can and will happen. As an aside, NDT Technologies offers dual-function LMA, LFMRT instrumentation for the quantitative assessment of wire rope deterioration such as external and internal broken wires, single and in clusters, corrosion including corrosion pitting, interstrand nicking, IWRC core deterioration, etc. Wire Rope Inspection Experts Standards and Guidelines the group plays a prominent role in professional committees, and it exerts undue influence on wire rope standards. For example, standards ISO 4309 2017, B30, and also International Marine Contractors Association, IMCA, Guidance on Examination of Steel Wire Rope Through Magnetic Rope Testing, MRT. Here it is noteworthy that these standards are geared to the group's single function LF only MRT equipment. All signal wave shapes shown are of their low quality version of an LF signal, the amplitude of which depends on rope inspection speed. This problem, as far as NDT technologies is concerned, makes their LF signal useless. Retirement criteria are formulated in a convoluted way in terms of number of broken wires without considering the effects of corrosion. They defy the common sense adage that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, including its corollaries. Please have a look at the picture. For a detailed discussion of these issues, please click on the picture and follow the link. Then click to continue. Advertising versus reality. To elaborate on the previous discussion, the community of wire rope experts is dominated by a group of university based mechanical engineers in a blatant conflict of interest position. They are also form the core of an, if you will, wire rope mutual admiration society. 
Here, mutual admiration society is defined as a group of people who routinely express considerable esteem and support for one another, frequently to the point of exaggeration or pretense. Despite several attempts, even major research in connection with some doctoral dissertations, they failed in their efforts to design and manufacture any viable dual-function LMA, LFMRT instrumentation. To this day, they can offer nothing but their single-function LF-only instruments, with a signal that allows no rational interpretation. This questionable LF signal forces the inspector to rely on guesstimating. Their MRT equipment is qualitative only, cannot be calibrated, and is, therefore, unsuitable for making rational rope retirement decisions. The LF signal is strictly geared toward the detection of single broken wires. It does not allow the quantitative assessment of broken wires and clusters, corrosion and corrosion pitting, winding on drum damage, etc. This is pathetic. Despite its blatant deficiencies, this second-rate LF-only MRT equipment is marketed and advertised as follows. Please follow the link. Here is the manufacturer's marketing write-up from his website. It is titled, Safe, Simple, Fast and Precise. The SMRT, Stuttgart Magnetic Rope Testing, named system is distributed by Mesomatic on the basis of a cooperation agreement with the Institute of Mechanical Handling and Logistics of the University of Stuttgart. More than 80 years of research and experience have gone into the development and continuous improvement. In addition to reliable functionality, special emphasis is placed on easy handling under the sometimes difficult conditions of practical use. The SMRT is ergonomically designed for one-man operation operates independently of weather, surface and light and is not affected by snow, ice, dirt or poor lighting conditions in its precise measurements. The design of the magnets and the measuring coils ensures that even the smallest and most varied defects on and in the rope can be reliably detected, displayed and thus interpreted. Stresa, Matero ne cable car accident causation. The cable car disaster in northern Italy has two root causes. 1. The moral hazard situation between the cable car mechanic and his management, with the underlying profit motive, and 2. The moral hazard and conflict of interest situation of wire rope experts and consultants. Here, the problem is overhyping of some very dubious wire rope inspection expertise. Their lack of knowledge manifests itself in their futile attempts to develop state-of-the-art MRT instrumentation, and their framing of wire rope retirement criteria that defy common sense. For the cable car mechanic, effective defenses against overhype would have been sound principles such as caution, sound judgment, skepticism, and critical thinking. Unfortunately, his defenses were penetrated by overhype, and he got persuaded that haul rope failures were extremely rare, or impossible. So he threw caution to the wind. That's how the cable car disaster happened. For a further discussion of these issues, a graphical representation will be used that is affectionately called the Swiss cheese model of accident causation. The Swiss cheese model of accident causation. The Swiss cheese model of accident causation is a model used in risk analysis and risk management, including aviation safety, engineering, etc. It likens systems to multiple slices of Swiss cheese, stacked side by side, in which the risk of a threat becoming a reality is mitigated by the differing layers and types of defenses which are, layered, behind each other. Therefore, in theory, lapses and weaknesses in one defense do not allow a risk to materialize, since other defenses also exist, to prevent a single point of failure, SPOF. The Swiss cheese model of accident causation illustrates that, although many layers of defense lie between hazards and accidents, there are flaws, holes, in each layer that, if aligned, can allow the accident to occur. Stresa Mata Rhone Cable Car Accident Causation Model, aka, Swiss cheese model. Hardware. Haul rope and emergency brake. Individuals. Human factors. Here are the haul rope and the emergency brake, including their Swiss cheese models. The hazard, in this case, is haul rope failure. 
To simplify the following discussion, we assume that the emergency brake will always be well maintained, and, as the last layer of defense, will never fail. Please note that all hardware-related hazards are indicated in red and by the red arrows. Among individuals involved, let's first consider the cable car mechanic. He is in the front line, if you will. He is in a position to perform unsafe acts. And only he can produce active failures. Among human factors, there is another universal layer of defense available to the cable car mechanic. That is the use of caution, sound judgment, skepticism, and critical thinking. This layer of defense, shown in light blue, would have immunized the mechanic against advertising over hype. He could have used caution and prevented a catastrophe. Next, let's introduce experts and consultants into the accident causation model. They give advice, promote their MRT equipment, and play a dominant role in framing wire rope standards and recommendations. Here is the corresponding Swiss cheese model. Experts and consultants can overhype their expertise, their MRT equipment, and the usefulness of questionable standards. This can produce latent failures. The hazard created by the consultants is advertising overhype. This is indicated in pink and by the pink arrows. Note that the cable car mechanic could have used caution, sound judgment, skepticism, and critical thinking as his layer of defense against advertising hype. Unfortunately, he was unaware of the danger and this layer of defense was penetrated. Based on the cable car accident causation model, let's now consider several alternative scenarios. Scenario 1 is idealized but, unfortunately, purely hypothetical. In this scenario, the hazard of potential haul rope failure is mitigated by a well-maintained and functional emergency brake. Furthermore, the hazard from expert overhype is eliminated by the mechanic's caution, skepticism, and sound, judgment. This would have prevented the catastrophe. Scenario 2 includes advertising hype from experts and consultants. This hype is universally accepted in the Western European wire rope and cable car community including, of course, the cable car mechanic. In Western Europe, this is the majority opinion. In situations like this, you should always heed Mark Twain's advice. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. In scenario 2, the consultant's advertising hype is successful in shaping the majority opinion. Their hyperbole penetrates the caution and good judgment of the wire rope community at large. The cable car mechanic is only human and joins the majority. He draws his own conclusions and simply assumes for himself that the haul rope will never fail. With this conviction and also based on his decade-long experience, quote unquote, the emergency brake is redundant and serves no useful purpose. So, when the emergency brake causes trouble, the mechanic simply disables it. After all, in his mind, and that of quite a few self-appointed and self-anointed experts, haul ropes never fail. So, when the haul rope fails, with the emergency brake disabled, the catastrophe is not prevented, and disaster strikes. Thank you for watching this presentation.